Welcome to What's New in Fusion 360. So in this webinar, we're going to be covering the July and August 2021 updates to Fusion 360. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, uh, please type them into the questions tab on the control panel, and we'll address them at the very end. So we're going to uh, cover a little bit about M2 technologies. So M2, we're a consulting firm focused on productivity, improving manufacturing process efficiency, and reducing manufacturing costs. By using generative design and best-in-class manufacturing and asset management processes, our team of industry experts can help you become more sustainable, more profitable, and more prepared to meet the demands of urbanization in a rapidly changing world. We're committed to helping clients realize the business benefits of BIM and asset management quickly and economically by facilitating the use of innovative processes and technologies. Whether it's streamlining your product design, maximizing asset longevity, or optimizing your processes, our team is one of the most experienced groups of manufacturing technology consulting professionals. We partner with world leaders such as Autodesk, Panzura, Eagle Point, and Bluebeam to utilize innovative technology and methodologies to empower sustainable manufacturing and overcome local challenges. To support the industry, we offer a wide range of services, including CAD management, data management, generative design, CIO advisories, and training. My name is Tristan Gunderson. I'll be your presenter today. I'm an applications engineer at M2. I work with our clients to help them optimize their workflows, get the most out of their software, and utilize cutting edge technologies. So a quick look at what we're gonna be covering today. We're gonna to be covering the entire update and added features uh, from July and August to Fusion 360. This includes updates to sketching and modeling, electronics, generative design, drawings, manufacture, API, and the new injection molding simulation. To start with sketching and modeling, we have three new features, which are the mesh environment, reference objects, sync all assembly context tools, and then the two improvements to the ruled surface options and the patterning bodies and components. The new mesh environment is one of the biggest changes in this update. Before the update, uh, mesh was limited to a preview functionality and could not interact with other solids within the program. Uh, now, Fusion 360 has an entire mesh tab to help you create, prepare, and modify mesh components. You can open SDLs, OBJs, and 3MF files in the same environment as other CAD bodies with seamless interaction. This means that mesh bodies no longer need to be separate from the rest of the design. They can interact just as any other 3D body would be able to. Uh, the mesh tools and operations are present on the timeline as well. So they can be undone, redone, and edited as any other operation with solid bodies. We also have recognition of intelligent meshes or face groups, which allows for quick and easy CAD-like changes. This allows you to select entire faces of a component, even if it's broken down into smaller mesh elements. We also now have new mesh to solid conversion options. It starts with the basic faceted conversion, which will convert the mesh as it is to a solid 3D object with all of the mesh faces. Next, there's the prismatic conversion. This will use the created face groups to create a more uh, solid body-like object, similar to one that would have been created using Fusion 360 natively. Uh, it is important to note this is available in the paid startup and educational offerings. So anyone with a full 
license will have access to it. It is not included in, however, uh, any free versions or the hobby version. And then lastly, we have coming out soon in the design extension, the T-spline conversion, which will convert it directly into a form object so that you can take advantage of the, the T-spline tools. Uh, this does not work well with any uh, triangular uh, meshes and prefers quadrilateral meshes. Uh, next, there's the added mesh repair option, uh, which the use of which was carried over from NetFab. So all of that design power is now added to Fusion 360. And lastly, some additional tools include the scale, plane cut, and combine. The scale is a quick, easy way to change the size of a component. Uh, this is especially useful when importing uh, SDLs or objects that are in a different unit, you can quickly use the scale to tool to convert those units within the new workspace. Uh, you can use the plane cut to uh, slice the mesh and edit it, and you can use the combine to add mesh objects together to create a single component. Here we can see a quick visual to kind of walk through the different uh, path. So you can see creating the mesh, refining the mesh. You can see the different colorations on there, defining the different face groups, and lastly, converting to a solid. Next, we have the reference objects. So the reference objects allows you to create associative references between external components and design features. So you can use uh, features and parameters from one element of an assembly to control other components within that assembly. You can access these uh, reference objects from the edit in place menu. When you reference design features, uh, you can reference them from anywhere in the assembly and you can quickly pull them up in the reference objects list here and see where you have references within your assemblies. Next is the addition of the sync all assembly context. When you have assemblies that are out of context, uh, they'll show up as warnings on the timeline. Normally you would have needed to uh, go through and use the sync assembly context tool on each of them individually. Now you can use the sync all assembly context to sync them all simultaneously. Next, we have our updates to the ruled surface. Uh, now, when you open the ruled surface command, you can actually choose between creating a body or a component right away. You then also, when you are selecting a planar sketch that's normal to your sketch plane, uh, it's, act, it's going to automatically set those surface directions uh, instead of having to set those manually. And lastly, uh, you now have the ability to set a, a miter on corners by specifying a draft angle while using the command. So here we can see another little visual of the changes to the patterning bodies and components. Instead of having the ghosted visual, it's now been changed to a wireframe visual. This allows you to easier visualize what the result is going to be, as you can see below. Now we can move on to the updates to the electronics. First, we have our two new additions, which are the new 3D PCB options and new parts added to the library. Then we have our improvements to the library editing performance, the library and package editor communication, and lastly, the 3D PCB via solder mask.
So for the 3D PCB option, uh, pretty comprehensive change here. Uh, when you now place a 3D PCB component into an, an assembly, you actually are able to use the edit and place feature to move the different electronic parts on that PCB board in order to uh, better fit them within your enclosure. So if you have a you know, piece of the enclosure that is going to uh, actually obstruct the positioning of that PCB board or a component on the PCB board, you can now move that component in place and then the modification will alert the PCB layout engineers that there needs to be edits made to the PCB board to make that change fit. So it allows for better communication and a better workflow when fitting these PCB boards into your larger enclosure. Next, we have the parts added to the library. So there's a variety of new components that were added to the electronics library. Uh, this, some of the highlights here are the digital potentiometers, AD converter ICs, new LEDs, and Bluetooth modules. You can see a couple of the highlighted ones here were the WS2812 series of the RGB LEDs as well as the Bluetooth SOC from Nordic Semiconductor. Next, we have our library editing performance and the package editor con communications. So when you're going through and adding components from the library, there's been improvements made to the navigation within the library editor. It now has faster switching between the symbols, packages, and footprint listings, so you can get all the information and compare quicker. And the search bar has been optimized so that you find what you're looking for quicker. Uh, then the communication between the library editor and package editor has been optimized, as well as the addition of an in-progress animation, so you know when your new package has been successfully added to the library. So all of these edits uh, work to make the entire uh, workflow and the, the editors quicker and easier to use. Next is our change to the via solder mask in the 3D PCB. It's been changed so that you now can actually visually tell the difference between the tented vias and non-tented vias within the 3D space as well as on the 2D schematic. Next, we move into the generative design space. Here we have one new tool added, which is the export properties data from Explore. And then we have the improved symmetry for additive manufacturing. So first with the exported properties data, there's now included a new button within the Explorer that is the export CSV. Uh, this allows you to export comma separated value text file for all of the information and outcomes listed within your Explorer. This file can then be imported into a spreadsheet like Excel or any other data analytics application you're using. The uh, key point of this is to be able to better utilize some of the, you know, analytical tools from other applications or workflows that you have in place. And in order to not, you know, bog the results down with having too much information or including uh, what, outcomes that you're not looking at, any filters or visibility constraints you put in place, such as, you know, filtering by manufacturing method or by the material used, uh, those, those filters and visibility in the Explorer will affect what the data exported is. So if you only have five uh, outcomes visible within the Explorer, those are the only five that will be exported in the CSV file. 
And then we have the symmetry for additive manufacturing. So the symmetry constraint was already available within un unrestricted outcomes for generative design. That now has been extended to include additive manufacturing outcomes. Uh, and one of the key features of this is not only does it, you know, create that generative design that is symmetric, it also creates that within the editable T-spline that results. So when you then make edits to the form of your generative design using the T-spline tools, that symmetric behavior will be maintained. And so any edit made to one side will be then made to the other as well. And so here in the picture, you can see making a single edit to a T-spline and having that affect all four regions because of those two symmetry planes. Next, we have our updates to the drawing. It is just one, which is an improvement to the in, van in canvas continue button. Uh, it's now available with symbol tools. This was previously uh, used when placing projected views. Uh, so when you place it, it gives you a little green check button to confirm the placement. This is now included for the surface texture, feature control frame, datum ID, welding symbols, and the taper and slope symbols. This will help you, you know, better place your components and confirm that the placement is correct before it locks in place. Next, we have our up updates to the manufacturer workspace. This is one of the largest areas of updates. As you can see, we have uh, six new features, which is the power mill navigation shortcuts, 2D pocket recognition option for contour mode. We have new AlphaWise printers added to the machine library. We have multi-edit uh, in component sources. And in preview, we still have now the uh, orientation by edge selection and the optimized perpendicular pass in steep and shallow, as well as improvements to continue rest machining for proceeding setup, uh, improvement to the turning depth of cut, and timeline graphical preview for toolpath modifications. So first we have the that power mill navigation shortcuts. Uh, what this allows you to do is set your navigation preferences to be uh, the same behavior as you would find in Power Mill. So if you're used to working in Power Mill and the navigation uh, throws you off working in Fusion 360, you now have the option to set that as the default along with the other previous available options. So this will change your pan, zoom, and orbit preferences. Uh, next, we have the pocket recognition in contour mode. So now when you're using contour mode, instead of having to select contours, you can use a automatic pocket recognition. Uh, and within this, you have filter options to filter by the min or max corner radius, depth, or whether to include or exclude holes. So this allows you to select your pockets you know, quicker and easier when doing the contour operations. We then have our AlphaWise 3D printers that have been added. This includes you know, three from the U20 series, as well as the U30 and the U50 3D printers from AlphaWise. This next one is our multi-edit in component sources. This is available within the nesting and fabrication extension only. Uh, when you are looking at your component sources in nesting, you now have the ability to select multiple components at once using either control select or shift select. And one of the key advantages of this is now when you have multiple components selected at once, you can actually make updates or edits to the nest parameters that will uh, affect all of those selected components simultaneously. So instead of having to go down a list to make the same change multiple times, you can do it all at once. And next we have uh, in preview for the advanced arrange extension. 
the orientation by edge selection. So this allows you to select edges of a component and then have those uh, aligned parallel to the length of your stock, which is the X axis. So if you watch the animation here, you can see we've selected the edges we want and we're selecting the direction we want on the face and then we hit preview. You can see that it aligns all of those along the X axis to better use our space within that stock. Next, we have our optimization to perpendicular pass in steep and shallow. This is available in the machining extension as the steep and shallow tool is part of that extension. Uh, what this allows us to do is when we're creating a, a perpendicular pass, so normally it will just continue traveling in you know, one direction. However, as we come along edges that are you know, perpendicular to that direction of travel, it often will have a poor surface texture ultimately because it isn't able to capture that detail the same. So this allows the, the program to uh, analyze the gradient of that surface and actually uh, be able to flip that pass direction 90 degrees for those areas in order to get a better surface finish. So you can see as it's coming along the perpendicular face, we are getting a switch in direction to 90 degrees to come down the face rather than trying to run parallel to it. Then we have our continue rest machining from preceding step. This is a new option when doing a new setup and we have a rest machining set in place. So when you're changing operations or tools, uh, this will allow you to grab uh, information and setup from your previous setup uh, so you can capture that stock and other settings. Of course, you know, this needs to be used with a continue rest machining selected uh, as you need to have that previous setup ready to go to then capture the information as part of the new tool of the from preceding setup. But this allows you to uh, better visualize and optimize that workflow as you're switching tools or manufacturing processes. Next, we have our turning depth of cut. This is a new parameter added to both turning tools and boring tools. Uh, by setting the depth of cut, you can then, while doing turning operations, select as your maximum depth of cut the tool depth of cut, which will then automatically select set that maximum to the set parameter for the tool. Uh, the key benefit of this is if you need to change tools down the road uh, or if you are updating the parameters on a tool, it'll then automatically update the tool path on your part so that you aren't overextending that tool and having a, you know, an interference cause because your tool is too short for the operation. Next, we have the timeline graphical preview for tool path modifications. This is present in the machining extension where you have access to the trim tools. Uh, the trim tools are used to modify paths often to uh, remove extensive uh, paths beyond the uh, part. Uh, when doing this, you can see those different modifications on the timeline and you can actually visualize those. So it'll give you a preview that shows you uh, what edit was performed, what the resulting tool path from that was, and if you trimmed off any of that tool path, uh, what that region of tool path that was removed was. So this helps you better visualize what these edits are and modify them as needed.
near the end here, we have our changes to the API. So we have our new browser command input and log method on application objects, as well as the improved custom feature capabilities. So first with the browser command input, it works very similarly to other command inputs, which allow you to define an area in a command dialog, as you can see on the side here. Uh, the difference with the browser command input is that it actually is defined rather than by coding in the API, but by an external uh, rendered HTML file. And so this allows you to have more complexity and versatility in what you create in these command dialogues as you have more tools at your disposal if you know how to use an HTML, HTML file as opposed to trying to do it natively in Fusion 360. Next, we have the log method on application objects. Uh, you could already write to text commands window uh, manually. However, it was a bit of a cumbersome process. So now they've made it easier to both write to the text command windows or to the Fusion 360 log file. Uh, the easiest way is the new command, which is app.log, and then in parentheses, in quotations, and write what you would like to have added to that text commands window. And lastly here, we have our custom feature capabilities. Uh, this allows you to now create new custom features uh, and add them as named values to a feature. Uh, this allows you to store any kind of information that you need that's outside of the uh, standard parameters with your custom features. Uh, one of the key functionalities here is the ability to indicate when an error is occurring because the uh, positioning point for the custom feature is no longer on a feature face. So when this happens, it'll actually uh, pop up as a warning on your timeline, and you're able to see that message and go in and make the changes to the placement of that uh, positioning point as needed. And then our last major update here is the injection molding simulation. This is uh, still in preview mode, uh, but it can, you know, you can go in and check it out now. Uh, the key is, you know, it allows you to simulate plastic injection molding uh, within the Fusion 360 simulation tool. Uh, so you can use this simulation to, you know, analyze the flow of an injection mold, uh, the temperature, uh, any shrinkage, and what that final surface quality is going to look like, as well as if you are going to have any kind of gaps or voids uh, because of the you know, it cooling too fast as it fills or anything else. Uh, while setting this up, you have, you know, some just some simple tools for setting the injection site, uh, selecting any priority faces where you want a better surface quality, selecting what material you want to use from uh, invent or from Fusion 360's list of materials. And lastly, you have some additional uh, settings for the process. And so when you get those final results, you can actually visualize what the flow is going to look like, how the cooling operation goes, uh, and see, you know, a readout of that process from filling to cooling and the final result. And lastly, we have just a few additional updates. The main one here is the addition of Korean and Spanish, Spanish languages. So if you're more comfortable working in one of those two languages, you now can utilize Fusion 360 fully in those languages. Uh, there also has been an icon changes for uh, Mac OS. Uh, this is to the, the file icon as well as the program icon just to better match the current branding. And there's been various uh, updates made to fix crashes that were happening in various workspaces, 
Uh, most of these were user submitted crashes that were uh, troubleshot by Autodesk, identified, and fixes have been made to them, uh, mainly in the manufacturing with meshes and in the electronics areas. And so with that, we're going to open it up to questions. So if you have any questions on what we've covered or other updates, uh, you can type those into the questions tab now. Going to give it another 30 seconds, but it doesn't look like we have any questions so far. All right, we have one question here. Uh, the question is that uh, did you say the software offers a sketching mode that might have been done on AutoCAD previously? Uh, I don't know of any uh, sketching mode from AutoCAD. Uh, there are options for making drawings and there are uh, sketching tools, but they link more closely with those seen in Inventor than found in AutoCAD. All right, well, if you have any more questions, oh. Uh. Right, so I prefer to draw a sketch in AutoCAD rather than Inventor prior to drawing Inventor. So you can actually import AutoCAD drawings into Fusion 360 if that is the workflow that you would prefer. And with that, uh, if you have any more questions, uh, please contact uh, M2 or your, your rep. And thank you for attending. You can contact you know, your sales associate directly or contact sales support or go to our website. And thank you for attending this webinar with us.